Start a recording one. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us. My name is Juan Garcia with the Irvine Ranch Water District. I am the Landscape Water Facilities Specialist and welcome to our Control Your Controller Workshop. Before we begin, give me a second, here we go. A, a bit of webinar housekeeping, please keep your microphones muted. Um, during the presentation, if you have any questions, please submit them via the chat feature and questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. And also at the end of the presentation, I will be emailing uh, the presentation slides along with any kind of supporting documentation. Um, Melody is standing by to assist you with any technical challenges you might have. We have a hotline which is 949-453-5656. We also have Joey managing the chat feature. So if you have any questions, once again, go ahead and put them into the chat function. Joey, anything to say? That's all, thank you everyone for joining. Thank you everybody, once again, please keep your mics muted. Right now, I'd like to introduce you to your host for today's webinar, IRWD Board Director, John Withers. Director Withers is an urban public policy expert. He is a partner with the California Strategies in Irvine and lives in North Park. He recently celebrated 30 years on the IRWD Board, and he is a vice chairman of the OC Sanitation District. So he knows his stuff. Please meet your host, IRWD Board Member, John B. Withers. Good to have you, Mr. Withers. Yeah, great to be here, Juan. And uh, for our audience uh, participating today, uh, Juan Garcia is IRWD's secret weapon when it comes to outdoor water use. So he's very uh, knowledgeable and uh, should have lots of good information for you today. And I'm pleased to be uh, part of uh, this program. And I'm also pleased that IRWD has been able to continue these popular classes in this new webinar form. Uh, and I wanna thank all of you for taking the time to join us today to learn how to control your sprinkler controller. Uh, uh, a little known fact is since 1990, the population served by our water district has almost quadrupled, a 270% increase from about 114,000 folks to 422,000 folks. But interestingly, our water use has only increased 35%, which is rather remarkable. It's been fairly flat. And that's the result of a lot of innovation by our IRWD. For example, uh, many of you know that our water-based rate structures send a pricing signal to customers when your water use exceeds your monthly water budget. And we work with you to get that back in line. Uh, and revenue from this over budget rate, from the over budget rate tiers are used to fund water efficiency programs, such as rebates on efficient irrigation equipment and smart, smart sprinkler timers and educational programs like this one. So we take the penalty revenue and reinvest it in the system to make it that much more efficient. Um, so by being here and learning how to keep your yard beautiful while also saving water, you are the real secret to our success and the district truly thanks you for that. Um, I will be happy to stick around for questions uh, after the presentation. But uh, I know we are all anxious to hear from Juan Garcia, our senior water efficiency specialist and uh, resident landscape guru. So Juan, welcome again. It, uh, the floor is all yours. And everyone, I hope you enjoy Juan's presentation today. Thank you, Director Withers. I really appreciate that. Thank you for your kind words. Okay, everybody. So here we go. We are off and, and running with this workshop. So um, one thing about this workshop, I didn't want to just keep it as uh, 
just me blabbing on about each slide. So I'm going to be taking you to some very informative pages, uh, our IRWD.com website, different links to look at all this valuable information that we have um, in regards to rebates and and also taking you to some different websites for some of these types of innovative new controllers that are out there. Um, before we start off, you know, I really always want to talk about, you know, right now we're in the peak of summer, you know, our watering is at the at the at its highest. So it's really to start looking at, well, you know, after August, you know, we're getting start getting into September and then the fall months. So really start to really look at uh, reducing our water use. But overall as a whole, you know, the main goal of any of these workshops is to really look at our landscapes and try to look at areas and, and, and consider reducing um, that water use. So when, when we start looking at the landscape and the highest water use plant material out there, we really start to focus in on our lawns because that's really what's taken you know, quite a bit of that water. You know, they say around 50 to 70% of our water goes out to landscape. And out of that landscape, most of it does go out to the lawns as if it requires, you know, a lot of a lot of water, quite a, quite a bit of water. We'll take a look at some, some of these slides. So consider, you know, reducing or eliminating unused lawn areas, you know, unused. You know, one thing I look at the lawns is, is it providing some kind of function? You know, if you're using it to recreate, great. But if it's just sitting out there, just taking up water and your time, you know, try to think about, can we replace that into something more water friendly, converting it to what we call climate appropriate landscape or climate appropriate plants, uh, California native plants, non-native appropriate species, but there's a lot of great stuff out there. And of course, you know, decorative hardscapes. So when you look at the lawn, I mean, these numbers are, are really, you know, factual numbers. You know, I, I dream of these numbers all the time when it comes to landscapes of how much water goes out there. I'm always looking at these irrigation systems and, you know, you can see by the picture, you know, that water going out there to that lawn. So, so for every thousand square feet of lawn that you have out there, you're going to, you know, that lawn's going to consume around 25 to 35,000 gallons of water, which is, which is quite a bit about 4,000 plus uh, or minus gallons per month. And this is during peak time. This is once the summer begins. So by taking that thousand square feet of grass, you know, consider converting it to a climate appropriate landscape, which, you know, reduce your water use about 30 to 50%. So now we're looking at a consumption around 15 to 20,000 gallons per year to around 2,500 gallons per month during the peak of summer. Take that same square footage and convert it to a climate appropriate landscape now with using low water use plants. You know, your reduction of water about 60 to 80% savings. 4,000 to 12,000 gallons of water a year per year consumption, right around 1,500 gallons per month. Now, if you really want to get water thrifty, then start really thinking about California native plants where they are to require water a different way. About 80% plus water savings. You know, we built habitat for pollinators. And that I love that third bullet point, fully or partially summer dormant. That's one thing that Today's workshop, we're going to be talking about all these factors that go into irrigation scheduling and the controller us, you know, us, con you know, using our controllers to control the way we place our water into the landscapes. When we look at natives, you know, once they're established, they require little to no supplemental water once they are established, which is great to hear. So we can have a beautiful landscape. And when I talk about natives, once again, I'm not talking about cactuses and sticks and rocks, you know, we're talking about beautiful evergreen natives that will look great throughout the year and require very little water. So with that said, let's get into the next part. So when we look at controlling our control, you know, our controllers water, hopefully to the season. And we're going to look at standard controllers. And we're also going to look at these new smart controllers that use weather data to irrigate. But hopefully we ourselves are managing our controllers, you know, I'm sure a lot of you out there have landscapers such as I do that come out and you know maintain the your landscapes and gardens, but you know how often do they go and check your controller? Typically when they go to a controller, it's to increase the the watering times because something's not looking right out there in the landscape. And with that, you know, starts happening the water waste and so forth. So we really got to look at us taking control of our controller and managing it, you know, by the season. 
so seasonal watering schedule. So we started looking at, so when, you know, how often should we be out there managing our watering schedule, managing that controller? So there's always those three main questions when creating a watering schedule for our landscape. Well, how long should I water for? How often should I water? What time do I need to start watering? You know, how long should I water for? It always depends on always on the type of plants you have. And of course, in the season, how often, once again, it's the weather that's going to dictate how often you're going to be watering and the plant material. And when do I start? When is the best time to irrigate? You know, the best time to irrigate is in the early morning hours because you want to have the water inside our sponge, our soil sponge, for the plants to start utilizing that water throughout the day. Towards the afternoon is the time when plants start to go into kind of their little slumber time when it's not the most optimum time to water. It's always those morning hours when you want to get the water once again into the soil. Some of the benefits of proper watering. Once again, we're going to have a landscape that looks great. Hopefully stay within our budgets. We're going to conserve water. We want to use it efficiently. We're going to have healthier plants and of course, we're going to have a nice healthy soil by not oversaturating those areas. You know, that's one thing that we see quite a bit of is a lot of oversaturation, a lot of overwatering. Typically, once again, when the landscape doesn't look good, we tend to start to increase our watering. And uh, just for note, you guys see that beautiful landscape in the picture. That is a California native landscape. Looks pretty nice. So what kind of factors determine our water need in the landscape? You know, of course, it's going to depend on uh, our area of landscape, how big of a landscape we have. The plant types that we have out there, the high, moderate, low, very low water use plants. And these are all, in, this is all information that gets put into when creating a schedule. But we're going to take a look at all this. Like I said, this, I don't want to get too technical. We're going to keep it simple and just look at overall how plants use water, how the soils take up water, the irrigation system, and then the controller itself. So once again, it's very important to manage our watering to the season. And microclimates. Microclimates is a big thing because overall, you know, yes, it's hot, but our, our homes, our properties, they create these little microclimates all around our, our property. For instance, how about if you have shady and a nice shady area? And if that station or that irrigation station is watering just like the other open full sun areas, you know, that area might get a little extra water or just or excess water. So it's maybe time to consider to do a little bit of reduction in those sh little shady areas. Or if it's really hot, you have a lot of reflective surfaces, windows, uh, walls that reflect heat onto that area. That area might require a little extra care. So you might want to maybe bump up a little bit of irrigation in that area just to compensate. But the main goal is always to control the amount of water that gets placed out there. And you know, it's hopefully we stay within our budgets. And we're gonna take a look at a little bit about water budgeting a little bit later. So here are the main watering factors. So of course we have our weather, you know, right now we are in peak summer. So this is really gonna dictate how we water right now. The type of plants that we have out there, once again, how much water do these plants need during this time? Do they need water during this time? We're gonna be pretty surprised when we look at the different types of plants. And then the irrigation system. Now the irrigation system, I can't um, you know, stress enough that we should be really maintaining those irrigation systems as best as possible. Um, you know, sure, we rely on our landscapers to go out there, but once again, how often are they turning on your sprinkler systems and doing a visual checkup of them? So I would recommend, you know, for us as homeowners and residents and customers to turn on your sprinkler systems, you know, at least once or twice a month, do a nice little thorough walkthrough of the system and note any kind of issues you might be having and, uh, and fix those issues quick before they get out of hand. By having a, uh, an operating efficient system, we're going to use less and less water because sometimes by the irrigation not working properly, we start to increase that those watering times to compensate for that. And yes, the water, you know, we're getting that extra water out there, but we're also uh, wasting water. And our soils, you know, making sure we have a good soil medium. You know, one thing I hear a lot in our in our service areas that we have a lot of clay soils. Well. We can, um, we can build up those soils by incorporating more organic matter into them, such as compost. But that's for another class, which hopefully we're gonna be having later on. But 
uh, that's a great thing that I always consider is so, so all these different factors work hand in hand when we're creating our our schedules and managing our controllers. For instance, the soils, how fast is that water being uptaken by that soil? That's where we're gonna, it's better to have more start times and short run times to allow the water to infiltrate or to go into that soil. We're gonna be looking at that concept a little bit later. Okay, let's move along. Weather, plant, and water relationships. Now, this is where we start getting into mixing all these different concepts together. So when we start looking at plant material, well, you know, how much water do these plants need? You know, what are California friendly or drought tolerant plants? What are California native plants? Is there a difference? One thing with plant material, sure, there is a difference on the amount of water that is required by each of those types of plants. So here we have our beautiful Mediterranean climate. And as you can see here by the picture, you know, we follow that same, that same degree right on our, on our planet. So here's California, here's the Mediterranean basin. You can see the same climate zone, same thing as Chile and South Africa and Australia. So we all have similar climate zones. And so all these plants from these different regions can adapt well into our climate zone. So when we look at plants from all around the world, acclimate to our California uh, Mediterranean climate. These are great plant selections. And I bet you most of them, you already have them into the landscape, right? We are not a desert, California. There are, there's deserts in California, but you have to look at all our unique climates in California. You know, we are what it's considered, you know, we have coastal St. Club community. That's where uh, Irvine sits. So we have a lot of that ocean influence along with the, the little hills behind us that create our little unique microclimate. So when we look at different plants, you know, we look at first at California friendly plants. So these are climate appropriate plants from all around the world that do that do great in our in our climate. They are moderate water users, moderate or medium water users. Uh, they do need summer water. So we know that once summer begins, we do have to start watering these types of plants, but not as much as, as you would, uh, a cool season grass or a grass type. So we call, we stick these into our medium water use category. Sometimes they're in there also, they can be called drought tolerant as they do require half the water than most of our high water use plants. We have beautiful California native plants, but once again, with these native plants, they are a different beast. Um, they do require water at different rates and at different times of the year. So we'll take a look at a chart later on that'll show a little bit more information on California native plants. Uh, they do build habitats for our pollinators. But look at that bullet point number two, fully or partially summer dormant. That's that's great to hear when we talk about our native plants. Whereas other plants are active, these really start to slow down in the summertime. They are active, but they really slow down and use that time to really just produce seed and uh, get ready for the winter months when they do require the water. They require little or no supplemental water once they're established. I, you know, I'm a plant lover. I have almost every single plant type you can think of in my landscape, but they are grouped together with similar water needs. And I know that this summer so far, my native area, I've only watered it maybe once a month just to give it a good healthy amount of water to keep it looking lively, which is great. When we look at the way plants lose water, you know, you have that big old technical, you know, word right there, ETO, evapotranspiration. And basically that's just the way that we measure water loss from a plant and the soil. So it's it's the transpiration part is the, is the water that moves from the roots through the plants and out the leaves into the atmosphere. And the evaporation part is the way the water evaporates from the soil. And so there's ways for us to measure this and this is actually how we create our, our, our budgets in Irvine. We have three weather stations in Irvine, which you're gonna take a look at a, at, a, at a picture next, but we take that data and we create our budgets based on, on some certain criteria, which is we're gonna look at a little bit later. So when we add water to the landscape, we compare it to rain. So if we know how much water a plant has lost, we can put that water back by irrigating. So it's all relative. 
Here's a nice picture of one of our weather stations. And if you note, what is that weather station sitting on top of? It is sitting on top of cool season grass. And cool season grass is the highest water use plant. So that's always kind of like the, the cup is full or, or our measuring point. This is what we measure water loss from. And then everything else gets put into a category when it comes to plant material. And that's how we start placing that water back into those plants. So we measure that water loss in inches. Sprinkler systems put out water in inches, so we're able to put that water back. So it's again some technical information, but this is valuable information that is used when we create our your schedules or just scheduling in, in for any type of landscape generally throughout the state or the country. So here's a little bit of weather data once again. So this is actually weather data from that weather station we were just looking at. So throughout the year, you can see how grass is losing water. And just like rainfall, we measure rainfall in inches, we measure water loss in inches. So you can see here in peak summertime, July, August, that grass has lost quite a bit of water. You can see in July, that grass lost about six inches, a little over six inches of water, which is quite a bit of water. So there's that water loss. When it comes to plant material, we have uh, different categories for that, for those plants as far as how much water they need. And it's basically just a percentage. So when we look at this slide here of water loss for cool season grass, when we start putting water into plants, we're only putting back a certain percentages based on the, all the water that was lost on that cool season grass. So we call that plant factor. So here we have high water use, for grass, moderate water use. This picture here is for Indian hawthorn, a very common plant found in our landscapes. Here we have low water use plants as far as some ceanothus. This is some very low water use and also some other very low water use plants. So you can see these different categories. Once again, it is a little technical, but all you really got to look at that it's just the percentage of overall water loss when we start creating these watering schedules. So here's a good example of that, of filling up that water cup. So here's how much water that grass lost in July. If you have what's called, uh, so for us in our, in our water budgets, we budget water for what's called a warm season grass, like a St. Augustine or Bermuda type grass. So that's how much water should, that grass should be getting throughout, throughout those, that month. When we just move over to moderate water use plants or medium water use plants, it's around four inches or that you can see that water cup just getting less and less water. So right around 50%. So our budget's based off of the 65% for moderate water use. And then we have a little bit less water and you can see we start getting into that low water use plants. It's only gonna require you know, around 1.9 inches compared to the six inches that that, that plant lost, the grass lost. And then of course we have our native plants. You can see how much water is required in July for that for these different types of plant material compared to grasses. You know, quite a bit of savings when you start looking at these other types of plant material for the landscape, whether they're medium water use, low water use, or very low water use. So let's see, we are right around 1225. Perfect, I think we are going at a good pace. If I'm going too fast, please let Joey know by chat. I'm sure he will let me know, but hopefully um, we've been getting this information out there at a good pace for everybody. So when it comes to watering to the bell curve, you know, as you know, as springtime approaches, we start to increase our water use typically. By summer, we are at that maximum peak of watering. In the fall and winter, you know, we, it's that it's that time to really start reducing our water use. So we should start going to those controllers and start, you know, bringing those uh, those basically the days, the number of days that we're watering is really start to uh, reduce those days. And later on, we're going to take you to a schedule where I'm going to show you that uh, this time, you know, this is the time to start reducing our watering when we start getting to fall. So remember to water to the season. You know, by fall, we should be reducing our watering by 30%, which is quite a bit, but our plants, the days are getting shorter. Our plants start to know that they start to become less active and start to require 
less and less water. Sure, it is hot out there. You know, September comes and we get these heat waves coming, and it's okay to you know to uh, to turn up you know a little bit of, of watering during that time. But we should really be about 30% less, knocking off some of those days. So when do I start watering? Well, do I wait until summer? What about spring? So once again, water to the weather. Look at how our season is going. If we have spring showers, our landscapes will be fine. If not, then we're going to have to do a little supplemental watering ourselves. Now, earlier I've been mentioning California native plants and how it's completely opposite. So for our native plants, the water need is, um, is opposite. They awaken from their summer slumber. They, their water need begins in late fall through spring, deep and infrequent watering. So here's that chart again, you guys. So there's the water loss from cool season grass as the weather station measures. Here's our annual rainfall when we do have rain, right? Because we are in California, we do experience cycles of drought. But here is our typical annual rainfall. This is how much water a cool season grass usually needs throughout the year. For our water budgets, we budget for warm season grass. So this is how much water a warm season grass needs throughout the year. We also budget for climate appropriate plants. So this is how much water a climate appropriate landscape. So this is anything but grass. You can see that water savings is about 50% to the overall loss of water loss. Now, here's the beauty. This is what California native plants want as far as water throughout the year. So it's a complete different bell curve. Now, um, this is something that when you, if you do have native plants, we might have to manage. We're going to have to manage them a lot different and our controllers can do the same. So make sure that all these plants are grouped together according to water. Need. Now, here we go. So we talked about all the different factors. We talked about weather and water loss and plants. Now, and hydro zoning and grouping them together. Let's talk a little about sprinklers really quick, once again, and then we'll get into the controller. So when it comes to sprinklers, you know, um, I'm not gonna bore you because sprinklers can get technical, but they all apply water at different rates. When it comes to our controllers, spray heads, they have the shortest run times because they apply water at a really, really fast rate. So typically a run time for spray heads could be six minutes, seven minutes, eight minutes, right around there. Rotors, rotors apply water at a low rate. And um, so which, so rotors applying the water at a low rate, you have to run them a little bit longer. They are very efficient. Uh, spray heads are not that efficient. They're around, around, around 75% where rotors are around, around 80, 85% efficient. They did make these cool little rotating nozzles over here. Now, rotating nozzles are a mixture of a rotor and a spray head. So they go on to conventional spray head bodies, but they place water out like a rotor. Nice and slowly deliver almost like rain. The, the soils are able to absorb it a lot better. Of course, we have drip irrigation that requires a long run time because the water is being applied at a very, very slow rate. Where spray heads, rotors, and rotating nozzles place out water in gallons per minute, drip places out water in gallons per hour. So we're talking longer run time. So that's very important when we're out there scheduling or programming our controllers to make note of what's being watered with what type of sprinklers and what kind of soil we have out there. So speaking about soil, so soil is going to dictate the whole cycle and soak. So you can see here by the nice little diagram of how fast the water permeates these soil types and how far those roots stretch out and plant material. So when it comes to cycle and soak, and you're going to see that in our watering schedule a bit later, it's important to, you know, to break up our watering run times and have more, we call more cycles and more start times. So if I need to water my shrubs for 12 minutes, it's better to water for three start times per day for four minutes and you know 30 minutes in between each of those cycles. So that's what we call our cycle and soak. So we're gonna get into these uh, start times and everything. Okay, everybody, I think we made it. So now we are to the part with the irrigation controller. Now, 
I'm sure everybody out there has different controllers. So uh, this is going to be more generic and we're going to look at the features that each controller has. Now, one thing, um, you know, be honest with yourselves. If you're not too familiar with your controller in, you know, that's in your garage or outside, go take off that face, open up the box, take a look at that controller. If you can remove any of the panels to see where these wirings go, as you can see here on this picture, here we have, you know, zones or stations, one, two, three, four, five, and six. You have your AC power. So this is all important information to get familiar with when it comes to uh, sprinkler timers. So these are standard irrigation controllers. Um, some of the standard features we're going to see out there are date and time, start times, run times, the watering days. Are, does it have a seasonal adjust? What does that mean? Programs, what are programs used for? Uh, what can these, uh, these things help me in programming my controller? So it's very important to look at, um, at your controller and get to know them as best as possible. If you don't have the manual, a lot of these manufacturers have those manuals uh, online as PDFs. So I'd recommend you to go online and download them, make a copy, put them in the box, keep them with you, and uh, that way you can learn that controller a lot better. So when it comes to irrigation controllers, it's just a simple little computer, little operating system that controls when those sprinklers come on, how long they water for, how many days they come on for, start times. Um, it turns on a specific irrigation valve or station at a specific time for a specific length of time. So what, what can controllers do? They can they eliminate the need to water by hand. You know, I love watering by hand, though. If you can water by hand, great. But if you can't, this is what a controller can do. They can operate your irrigation system. They conduct, they conduct complex watering schedules set by you, right, the manager. They can potentially save you water, money, and they can potentially save you water. But the most important thing is they, you know, if you manage them properly, they can efficiently put that water out there when needed. What can't most controllers do? They can adjust your irrigation timer and account for daily or weekly weather patterns. But once again, this is a standard timer. They can't turn off them. They can't turn themselves off when it rains. Maybe yes or no. Um, they can't tell when you're uh, what you're watering. Uh, they can't adjust themselves, and that's just for standard timers. But what, I want to show you. I want to go back really quick because that second part that says they can't turn themselves off when it rains. Most um, a lot of these standard controllers, if you open up the face, most you will see on some of them that have this little rain sensor and this little relay switch. By you taking off this relay switch and buying a simple two wire rain sensor, you could plug them into these relays, put that sensor out where it'll get rainfall, and these controllers will shut off for a certain duration based on that type of rain sensor that you put on there. So that's just food for thought for later on. Okay, let's get to here. Ooh. So one thing I want you to also get familiar with is these is the controller valve wiring. Now, that's something that's very important when it comes to controllers. You know you, that you might not be aware. So take a look at those wiring. And one thing that a lot of manufacturers have done for us to make it easier is most residential systems have these color coded wires that have um, that are labeled to each individual station. So you can see here by this controller, this controller here has three stations on it, and they're blue, green, and purple on the wiring. So what I want, what I did was I labeled to where each of these uh, these wiring goes to. So you can see here that station number one is right here, and these in each of these valves has you know, two wires coming off what's called off of the solenoid. So you can see here the control wire is hooked up to one there. Valve number two, you have the green control wire hooked up to one of the wires there. And this other station here with the purple uh, line hooked up to this station or this valve here. What they all share in common is this white wire here, which is called the common wire. Now, that extra wire that's left out from that solenoid, they all get looped in. And that's how this controller communicates with these valves. So when station number one triggers on by this controller saying the signal, this is this station triggers on here, this number one, and then the water goes out to that part of the landscape. 
And then once this one is done, the next one will come on in sequence and so forth. So when that first start time begins, it'll start off with one and then move on to the other stations. If that is what you have in your system. Okay, so here we go for the next station. And this is a reminder, I am going to be sending this slide presentation to everybody so you can always have this to refer to. So what's the goals of ultimately programming your, your, uh, your irrigation controller or managing it properly? The ultimate goal is just once again to use that water efficiently to put a lot less time and effort into um, going out there back and forth and reducing your, your water waste. So common controller instructions, date and time. So we're going to be looking at all these different things. So when it comes to programming our controllers, so make sure that the date and time is noted on the controller. Make sure that's up to date. Sometimes the power goes out. So one thing also is make sure those batteries, if it requires a battery backup, make sure to uh, have that controller battery um, you know, it replaces every 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 year to make sure that it's backing up that information and make sure that the date and time is set properly. Learn, like I said, not everybody has the same controller. This controller here is a very simple old controller, but has very pertinent information that is very common to most controllers. So make sure you move those dials to the date and time and have that set appropriately. Now programs, Some, I believe a question came in earlier about programs. Now, on most controllers, not all, you will have, uh, you will see where it has a feature where it has programs. So here on this controller, you'll see this little button that says ABC, and that's for program A, B, and C. Um, what is the benefit of, of having programs? Uh, programs are very important to start breaking up your landscapes into different areas. For instance, grass requires more frequency of watering. So it's important to um, have that grass on a different program uh, compared to, let's say, a planter material that requires a, a whole different frequency of watering. So let's see here. Let's let's get into some another next slide to show you what I mean about the use of programs. So this here is our IRWD recommended irrigation schedule. So as you can see here. Turf grass, if you look at the days or frequency, let's look at July. Well, let's look at August since we're in August. So grass, we're going to be watering. It's recommended here to water four days, three cycles or three start times of three minutes. Where drought tolerant plant material, it's saying two days, three cycles of four minutes. If you have all your planter areas and your grass on one program, you're basically going to be watering your planters more than what is needed because you're going to be watering. You always want to water to the highest water use plant, which use typically is our grasses. So if you're watering your grass every single day or five days or six days out of the week, those planters are also going to be getting the same five days or six days out of the week of watering when in actuality they don't require so much watering or so many days of watering. So that's why it's important to start breaking up those different plant material types into different programs. Now, this is not a scheduling class, but hopefully I'm going to be having a scheduling class um, a little bit uh, later on in the year where we could take a look at uh, and creating schedules, the importance of really making note of this on a spiral notebook, a piece of paper, and noting what's watering and when so we can start using these programs to what is needed. Frequency of watering. This is very important. So the frequency of watering, how many days of the week do I need to watering? You know, am I, am I going to be watering one day, two days, three days, four days, five days? So which days am I watering? So it's important to note, note what days of watering. And you can always refer to your scheduling on how many days per week you need to water. So learn those features. It's very important. Cycle starts. So cycles basically refers to start times. It's really important to consider, you know, how many starts as we talked about earlier about 
about breaking up those those minutes of irrigation. Once again, the best time to irrigate is early morning hours. Um, you can see here by the, if I need to water for six minutes, it's better to have three start times for two minute run times and have about a good 30 minute uh, break in between each of those cycles. Hopefully that does make sense. So cycle start times is important. So let's see, if I were to set up a, a schedule, let's say I needed to water my grass and it's telling me to water four days. So select your four days. And if I need to water that grass for um, six minutes, then I'm going to have those those stations set to three minutes, that, those stations that water grass and have two start times. So maybe I'll start watering at five in the morning and then have my next start time at six in the morning or 530. You always want to keep yourself that that little bit of gap to allow the water to permeate that soil. So it's really important to look at those cycle start times. The duration is also important. You know, duration is basically your run times. How long do I need to water? And you can always once again refer to your schedules on those watering durations. The seasonal adjust now, this is a great feature to look for on your standard controllers. As you can see here, sometimes it will say seasonal adjust, water budget, or have this nice little percentage symbol. And that's a quick and easy way to to program your controllers. If you do have this seasonal adjust feature, most controllers on their um, on their manuals will have a page dedicated to the seasonal adjust. And they tell and most and most of them tell you, okay, so we want you to program this controller for summer run times. So you're gonna water, you're gonna program this controller for the peak month, which is typically July. So you're gonna look at July or August, I know August, I would select August. Here it is right here and say, you know what? I'm gonna program my controller for August, even if it's January or February. And once you have this controller set up for peak run times, then you simply go to this water budget or this little seasonal adjust. And it's basically, you're, all you're doing is reducing that percentage and you start to reduce it by percentage. So, Let's go back really quick and look at the schedule here. So you program it for August, but then you let's say it is January and it's saying here here to have your controller set at 30%. That's once again recommended. You might have your controller all completely off in January because you might have great rain. So it's one of those things to where you can use that seasonal adjust to adjust your watering um, for each month just by changing up that percentage, which is really great. Once again, this is a feature that your controller might have and or might not have, but it's one of those things to look at and look at your manuals, look at your, your controllers. And uh, you're gonna have to make sure to read it and make the adjustments. For instance, this controller here, when you do set it to that water budget, when you do change the water budget, you are gonna have to eliminate some of those days per week. So there is some um, some other adjustments that these controllers take, but most of those other functions are very simple and very common um, features that most controllers have. Now, with that said, let's see, it is perfect. It is 1245. I want to get into some smart timers, some information, and then some of our programs. Once again, if you do have questions, if we do if we do not have too much time to answer your questions after the, the workshop, we're gonna go ahead and I'm, I'm gonna be answering everybody's questions that they submit via chat. I'm gonna be emailing everybody after the presentation. So smart timers, this is one of the great things I wanna talk about. So smart timers, basically we call them WIBIX, you know, weather-based irrigation controllers. So they, they use, they automatically, adjust using information, whether it's weather data, soil data, just great stuff. And there's great rebates that we have for these types of uh, controllers. One thing that's important to consider is make sure look for that water sense label. So we have smart timers that are that have add on or plug in devices. So some of these manufacturers, if you have a conventional or standard controller, they do make on add-on feature, add-on devices that can
be added onto your current controller to make it a smart device. But to, once again, depending on the type of controller you have out there. So you can always go to the manufacturer website and see if they do offer any kind of these add on devices. Some of these smart timers, they have um, sensors that go that, that you have to put up there on site. For instance, here we're looking at a smart line controller. So this is a smart controller where you program very smart information. One thing about these controllers is uh, these smart timers is you start to program in smart information. Whereas the standard controllers you're putting in, you know, run times and days of the week to water and start times. These controllers are going to ask you sometimes for your zip code. They're going to ask you station by station. What are you watering? Whether it's a grass. A shrub, a native plant, really smart information. What kind of soil do you have? Even if you have a slope, I mean, it starts to really ask you smart information that this controller takes into consideration and uses this weather data or weather sensors to start adjusting to your landscapes. And here we have signal based controllers where these signals are receiving data via signal daily hourly just depending on the type of controller and a lot of these controllers are now they have their app base which are great so you can control them using your smartphone and if you guys if i really wanted to get funny right now i could turn on my dad's sprinkler system and give him give him a quick uh, scare using my phone but i won't do that but yeah these controllers i mean there's great um, as far as the information that is used to water your landscape now Yes, these controllers sign sound great and dandy, but they do take, you know, us managing them. You know, it's not a set it and forget it type of controller. We do have to go in there and tweak them and adjust them to our landscapes, especially since we are, you know, uh, since we do have a budget for landscapes. There are some things that we have to go in there and tweak them as far as the plant types that we might be watering or the type of sprinklers that are set out there or how efficient efficient they are. We're gonna have to make sure that we do uh, go in there and adjust them um, and make them work for us. So yes, they do take a lot of, um, of the guesswork out from us, um, for us, but we're gonna have to go in there and tweak them and make them work for us. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna take you to some web pages. If you bear with me, Okay, everybody, so let me take you to, here we go. Okay, can everybody see? Let's go. So first I'm gonna take you to our IRWD.com website. Joey, uh, you're able to see that page, right? That's good one. Okay, so IRWD webpage. So there's some great information on here. If you log on to IWB.com under save water and money, this is where you're going to find information on how to videos, watering schedules, right? Scape resources, but let's take a look at at rebates. because That's something that we get asked quite a bit. Here's our rebate page. Here's the information for outdoor rebates and indoor rebates, but let's take a look at the smart timer rebate. You can see up to $255 per controller for less than one acre. So for if you haven't participated in a, in a smart timer rebate program in the past, this is a great rebate up to $255 with that rebate amount. There's a lot of controllers that fall within that range. If not less that you can possibly get a free controller from it. So one thing about these timers or these smart timers is you have to make sure they are on the, the weather based uh, irrigation controller list. So let's click on view now and this is going to take you to a, a different this is the socal water smart regional web page program from metropolitan water district and you can see here rebates start at 80 dollars. but once again our rebate is different for our customers so if you see this wording here you know just note that our you know our you go by the the uh, rebate information on our website as far as the amounts but you go to this page information on weather based controller and what I want you to do on this page is to go to the click here for list of qualifying models. 
And when you click on here, you can see you're going to get the book on all these different manufacturers and smart timers that are out there. I mean, it is a little bit scary. It's a 10 page list, but there are tons of controllers out there that are EPA water sense labeled that qualify for the rebate program. So it is going to take a little bit of research from you. Well, let's see, I'm going to take you. So I did open up some pages for a couple of these manufacturers. So here we have weather track weather track. You know, this is a really sophisticated controller. Um, but once again, app based um, where you can be looking at your sprinkler systems to your phone and adjust the making adjustments Just great information. A great tool to have for these types of controllers. Here's a weathermatic type controller. This is the one that has the on site sensors. And here is Rachio, very uh, popular controller at this moment. And with that said, I want to let you know that currently we have a program with Rachio where you can get a free Rachio smart sprinkler and as long as you pay for the professional installation, which is $99. Now it is required. Um, it is a pilot program. It is a program. So uh, make sure to read the, the uh, requirements for this program. Basically, if you haven't, um, if you haven't participated in a rebate program for smart controllers in the, in the past, you might be eligible. And also your landscape size has to be more than 1300 square feet of landscape and that information you can find on your water bill. If you do have any any questions regarding this program, there is uh, some support. You can always email us uh, at our water efficiency hotline our email address, which I'm going to be sending out to everybody. So it's very important to just read all the information in regards to these programs and eligibility. So with that said, oh, you know what? This I uh, found very important. Hold on a sec, let me see it. Okay, so one thing that uh, my mother-in-law, she does have a irrigation system. She actually has a sprinkler system off of her hose bib. And um, Joy recently made me aware of this new beehive uh, smart controller that goes on to the hose bib. And this is actually on the rebate program. If I'm correct, Joey, is that correct? That's right. There's actually two different uh, manufacturers on that rebate program. Great. Okay. So for those of you that, you know, that are interested, this is another great um, innovative new product. So as far as smart controllers, you guys, there, there's so many different uh, manufacturers out there. It's important to get familiar with um, with what's out there. You know, do a little research online, see what works best for your property if you're interested in a smart controller. And once again, we do have the program with uh, Rachio right now for that controller. So you can always go to the Rachio website to learn more about that controller and how they operate and what they can do. And, you know, always refer to that weather-based irrigation controller qualifying, qualif qualifying products list. It's very important. Once again, for information on our on these programs or any kind of rebate program, you can go to irwd.com and look for the rebates, or you can go to our rightscapenow.com website and look for these rebates. Okay, so here we go. So here's our rightscapenow.com website. On Rightscape Now. So here's um we have some upcoming workshops next month. We have our Fall into Gardening on September 16th, if you're interested. And we also have my garden, my watershed up now, and that's gonna be on October 14th at 12 p.m. For any kind of gardening questions or ideas if you're looking for plant material please visit our rightscape resources.com website where you can uh, do a plant data uh, plant search you can look at different types of gardens it's a there's a watering scheduling calculator on there 
printable plant list. I mean, it's a great resource page for any kind of gardening uh, tips and information you might be looking for. If you have any questions, you can always email me at askwan at irwe.com. We get, I get tons of emails uh, with some really great, uh, funny questions sometimes, but, um, and sometimes depending on the questions we get, you can be featured on our pipelines newsletter. So if you have questions, even if it's, you know, any kind of uh, gardening uh, questions, go ahead and shoot me an email at askwan at irwd.com. We have uh, our website, rdb.com. We do have the uh, email. You can email us at info at rdb.com. And we do have our number there for our, for our offices. Okay, let's see. Wow, this, this thing really went to the hilt. It is 1257. Joey, um, out of the questions that we received, is there anything that's, that sounds pertinent ever, I mean, something that we can just try to answer really quick. But once again, everybody, I'm going to be answering the questions that were submitted via the chat feature, and you will be having those um, by email along with some supporting uh, these slideshows and also some other supporting documents. Yeah, well, I was able to answer a few of these questions uh, in the chat already, but for ones that we weren't able to answer, one that seemed to be uh, pretty popular is if I have plants with different water needs, do you suggest moving them all to one irrigation zone? Um, if you have plants with different watering needs, well, you know, hopefully, one thing I we, I talked about was uh, hydrozoning or grouping these plants together. Um, if they're all being watered by the same zone or same station, you know, that's it's difficult to start to start to start separating. Um, one thing in irrigation or scheduling, you always water to the highest water use plant. Um, but for that question, you know, um, if you're still online with us, you know, go ahead and email me at askwan uh, at irwd.com and I'll reach out to you personally and we can kind of um, get into that a little bit more. So I, I, I need to have some further questions, I guess, for you uh, in regards to that. So. I'll, I'll get to hopefully I'll, I'll, I'll respond to that and um, hopefully I'll, that person will contact me. We have one more one. Um, if watering early in the morning uh, would uh, help the sun to slow down evaporation, should we also be watering early in the evening? You know, typically, you know, watering in the evening is it's really not a benefit to the plants as they start to reduce their water use. You know, it's just like, you know, we're, we're getting tired, we go to sleep. Uh, my mom used to always tell me, don't go to bed with your hair wet. Same thing with your plants. You don't want to put them, you don't want to have that water sitting on, uh, you know, on them in the evening hours. You know, it's a good time for funguses, other pathogens to attack your plants. Um, mulching is very important. You know, that's another way to stop that evaporation from the soil. You know, I can't, I can't um, stress enough how important it is to mulch our planter areas. You know, the more we have exposed soil, it's going to evaporate a lot uh, more water. So try to keep those areas mulched. You know, once again, uh, have more cycles, irrigate early morning hours to have that water into the soil. That's the, I think that's the best, the best thing for your plants overall. Any else, Joey? Yeah, we have uh, one more. Um, okay. What's the benefit of using multiple start times? Uh, won't spray heads get uh, water deeper? Uh, if I water once for a longer time, wouldn't that be helpful as well? Well, it, it all, it depends. You know, one thing we always have to consider is runoff. If the spray heads, they apply water at a really, really quick rate. So some of that water might not be absorbed by the soil and it starts to run off into other areas. So that's, that's why we stress the importance of using more cycles. When you water for a short amount of time, it gives that water enough time. It gives that soil time to absorb that water. And then when the next cycle comes on, it pushes that water even further down and allows that other water of application to permeate deeper and deeper, basically allowing us a deeper profile of, of that soil being wet and moisture and it allows those roots to extend themselves. That's a, that's the other thing too. We want those roots to push themselves down. So by us applying water 
in different cycles, it's we're pushing that water deeper and deeper down and allowing those roots to stretch out. That's, that's the importance of having multiple cycles. Um, usually for drip or when we have rotors and rotary nozzles that apply water at a lower rate, you know, yes, you know, for drip, we usually don't have more cycles. It's usually for that high, fast application stuff that we have. Yep, that's it. Okay, with that said, um, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us. Uh, Director Withers, thank you so much for, for joining us today. It was a pleasure having you. Um, once again, everybody that is still online, if you have any further questions or you have any specific questions, please email me at askwan at irwd.com. Um, hopefully we're gonna be having this presentation posted on our website uh, as soon as possible. So you can always refer to it. And once again, thank you for joining us. Joy Melody, uh, Director Withers, thank you for your time and everybody have a wonderful weekend and join us in the future for other workshops. Thank you for now.